Angioid streaks are breaks in the degenerated Brooks membrane. which typically form around the optic disc and radiate from the optic disc as we can see in this image. These breaks have a linear appearance and resemble blood vessels, which is why they are called angioid streaks. In fact, angioid streaks can be confused for retinal blood vessels on superficial examination. Angioid streaks were first described in 1889 by Doyne, but the term angioid streaks was first used by the German-American ophthalmologist Jacob Hermann Knapp in 1892, so they are also known as Knapp streaks. Of course bilaterally, but asymmetric. Angioid streaks are orange, red, grey or brown in color. Associated fundoscopic findings may include orange skin pattern is a diffuse modeling of the retinal pigment epithelium usually located in the temporal mid-periphery. Also optic nerve drusen. Peripheral subretinal crystalline bodies and focal atrophic spots. As we can see here, angioid streaks can be idiopathic or can be associated with numerous systemic diseases, the most common being Pseudosanthoma helasticum. A popular mnemonic rule used to remember the most common associations is Pepsi. Pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Ehlers Danlos syndrome. However, the recent literature has revealed that the association between angioid streaks and Ehlers Danlos syndrome is weak. Retrospective studies have shown that angioid streaks exist in less than 1% of patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Paget disease of the bone. Sickle cell disease. And idiopathic. Angioid streaks usually are asymptomatic unless they are subfovel. Complications Choroidal neovascularization causing metamorphopsia and or visual decline. Angioid streaks are a risk factor of severe subretinal hemorrhages due to rupture of the Brooks membrane following a relatively mild ocular injury. Safety glasses are an advisable precaution for patients with angioid streaks because they can be highly susceptible to choroidal rupture following even minor blunt injury. Fluorescein angiography is an important tool as part of the evaluation in any patient with angioid streaks and visual symptoms to rule out associating choroidal neovascularization. Fluorescein angiography also may be helpful to clarify the diagnosis when the clinical findings are not definitive. Angioid streaks appear hyperfluorescent due to overlying retinal pigment epithelial atrophy. Angioid streaks are usually asymptomatic, requiring observation only. Laser photocoagulation has been used in selected cases of choroidal neovascularization, but the recurrence rate is high. Photodynamic therapy has been used in the past with relatively poor results and frequent recurrences. 
treatment with anti-VGF agents has supplanted the use of laser treatment of photodynamic therapy. Intravitreal anti-VGF treatment is the main stain of treatment with good results. The rules that we are going to comment on were described by Linkoff in 1971 to locate the primary retinal tear in dermatogenous retinal detachment. After that date, they were rethought, appearing a new modified version. But in this video, we will talk about the original link of rules, those described by him in 1971. We can describe them with some very useful rules that allow us to identify the precise location of the retinal tear in 96% of cases of detachment of the primary rectmatogenous retina. First, we are going to make a series of clarification. Retinal detachment can be of three types, rectmatogenous, tractional or edematous. The rectmatogenous retinal detachment is one that is produced by a break in continuity in the retina, usually a hole or tear. These rules will be useful in rectmatogenous retinal detachment and should not be used in the other two types. On the other hand, retinal detachment may be primary or it may be a recurrence of a previous retinal detachment. These rules are going to be useful and we should use them in primary rectmatogenous retinal detachment. They are not so useful to us in cases of relapse or redetachment. We have also said that these rules allow us to locate the primary retinal tear that will cause the retinal detachment. But what happens when there is not a single break? What happens in cases of multiple retinal tears? Well, if there are multiple retinal breaks, the retinal hole that is located in a higher place is the one that is considered primary retinal break. The first rule will be useful in superior temporal or superior nasal rectmatogenous retinal detachment, and it tells us that the primary retinal tear is found in 98% of cases within 1.5 hours of the highest border detachment, as we have represented in the figure by the two red lines. The second rule is used in those total or higher rheumatogenous retinal detachment that cross the 12 o'clock meridian, which is the vertical meridian that passes over the optic disc. Well, in these cases, 93% of the time, the primary retinal break is at 12 o'clock, and if not, it will be found in a triangle whose vertex is located in the Ora Serrata at 12 o'clock and whose base extends from 11 to 1 hours. Rule number 3 is useful in inferior retinal detachments and it says that in 95 of cases the higher side of the detachment will indicate which side of the optic disc is the primary retinal tear and that tear, it will be located below the horizontal meridian. In those inferior detachments that have edges that are equally high on both the left and right of the optic disc, the tear is in the low retina at 6 o'clock. Linkoff's fourth and final rule is useful in Mulo's inferior retinal detachments. In these cases, the primary retinal brick will be located above the horizontal meridian. And in those cases of symmetric inferior bullous retinal detachment, with equal height on one side of the optic disc as on the other, 
They will be usually be caused by a small retinal hole that is located near 12 o'clock. Finally, remember that the Lipkov rules help us in regmatogenous retinal detachments. In primary retinal detachments and if there are multiple retinal breaks, the highest retinal hole will be considered the primary retinal break. In this video, we are going to see the ophthalmoscopic characteristics of retinopathy associated with malignant hypertension. This is the case of a 43-year-old male patient with malignant arterial hypertension and hypertensive encephalopathy. Optic disc swelling in arterial hypertension will always be considered the highest degree of hypertensive retinopathy in whatever classification we use. It is a marker of severity and represents the ocular manifestation of hypertensive encephalopathy. Without treatment, the life expectancy of these patients is 8 months. The mortality rate in the first year amounts to 80%. At three years, it reaches 94%. And it is 99% at five years. Only 1% of patients with this condition will survive five years. This is why the effective establishment of hypertension treatment is a vital urgency in these cases. Remember, optic disc swelling is the ocular marker of hypertensive encephalopathy. Ophthalmoscopically, in optic disc swelling, we see a decrease or disappearance of the physiological optic disc excavation. The sharp edges of the normal disc also disappear. They are now blurred and it is difficult to delineate the optic disc contour. Simultaneously, G3 edema, the margins of the optic disc are also raised. The neuroretinal ring appears swollen and hemorrhagic. And the edema and hemorrhages of the neuroretinal rim diminish or completely eliminate the vision of the cores of the vessels as they enter the optic disc. Ophthalmoscopically, heart exudates appear as small white or yellowish white deposits with sharp margins. They often appear as if they are made of wax, shiny or glittery. They can be arranged as single dots, confluent patches, sheets, rings or crescents. They are composed of lipoproteins, lipids and protein material, such as fibrinogen and albumin, that extravasate after the inner blood retinal barrier is broken. They will be deposited mainly in the outer plexiform layer of the retina. Thus, in the pathogenesis of heart exudates, we see a double origin. First, heart exudates are due to increased vascular permeability, which allows fluid and lipoproteins to leak into the retina. Subsequent resorption of d edema commonly results in the precipitation of the lipid residues within the outer plexiform layer. Secondly, the paralysis of the axoplasmic flow at the level of the ganglion cells, whose axons form the nerve fiber layer of Henle, is also involved. The stopped axoplasmic flow hinders the transport and drainage of the waste substances, thus favoring their accumulation in the hindered layer.
The formation of the macular star is due to the deposit of hard exudates around the macula, adopting a characteristic radial or star-shaped pattern. The soft exudate or cotton wool spot should not be called exudate because it is actually an ischemic edema of the retinal nerve fiber layer and not an exudate. It represents an infarction of the retinal nerve fiber layer due to an occlusion of a terminal arterial due to arterial necrosis. Remember that the cotton wool spot represents the ocular marker of the malignancy of arterial hypertension. When the cotton wool spot appears, the parenchyma of the target organs of hypertension, brain, heart, kidney, is suffering severe damage. A splinter or flame-shaped hemorrhages are a subset of retinal hemorrhages, which are located within the nerve fiber layer of the retina. They have a directional value since they are oriented, following the path of the ganglion cell axons towards the optic disc. Dot and blot hemorrhages are found deeper in the retina than flame-shaped hemorrhages or splinter hemorrhages. Usually in this case, the blood collects in the outer plexiform or inner nuclear layers. Each configuration is due to retinal compression, restricting hemorrhages to a specific place. They are easy to see in the peripheral retina, where the nerve fiber layer is thinnest. Dot hemorrhages are or resemble microneurism. We must differentiate them, although sometimes it can be difficult, and fluorescing and geography might be necessary to distinguish them. In this case, we can see dilated, thickened veins with a greater caliber. This is caused by the stagnation or difficulty of passage of the venous blood column at different levels. At the level of the optic disc, D2 edema, and also at the level of pathological arteriovenous crossings, arteriovenous knicking. We also see the relationship of the arteriovenous caliber altered. This is due to the decrease in the ratio between the caliber of the artery and the caliber of the vein. The causes are two. The increase in the venous caliber, as we have seen, and the decrease in the arteriolar caliber, due to the vasoconstriction of the arteriole. Arterial venous nicking is the phenomenon where an arteriole is seen crossing a venule, which results in the compression of the vein and alterations in the venous blood column. It is thought that, since the arteriole and venule share a common adventice at the level of the arterial venous crossing, the arteriole's thicker walls and the greater pressure of its blood column push against the walls of the venul, forcing the venul to collapse. Other theories suggest that this results not from compression from the arteriole, but from sclerotic thickening or glial cell proliferation at the site where the two vessels cross. Here we can see bonnet sign thicumambulated, which is made up of the following triad. An arteriovenous nicking associated in the vicinity of the crossing with a cotton wool spot and retinal hemorrhages. Here we can see the retinography of the right eye of the clinical case. And here you can also see his left eye. 
Thank you so much for your attention. Pneumatic retinopexy is a minimal invasive and non incisional procedure for repairing retinal detachment in selected clinical cases. It consists of injecting an expendable gas and applying retinal cryotherapy or laser photocoagulation to seal retinal breaks. This procedure is associated with reduced morbidity, reduced cost, and faster postoperative recovery compared to pars plana vitrectomy and scleral backlen. In this picture, we can see the intraocular gas bubble and retinal scars from cryopexy. The technique of repairing retinal detachment by retinopexy followed by gas endotamponate was first described by Rosengrin in 1938. However, this method was not widely practiced until after the publication of Hilton and Grissard's paper in 1986, in which they describe what we recognize as a modern pneumatic retinopexy. The recommended surgical technique begins with a clinical examination and identification of retinal breaks. Retinal re-examination with confirmation of all areas of pathology is very important. The eye is anesthetized with topical proximetacaine and subtenon or subconjunctival injection of 2% lidocaine. If necessary, a retrobulbar block can also be performed, but this would affect the patient's ability to cooperate in moving the eyes in the direction necessary to treat retinal tears. Visualize retinal breaks with the binocular indirect ophthalmoscope. Apply transescral cryopexy to the retinal breaks. Care should be taken to avoid excess cryotherapy to prevent possible release of retinal pigment epithelium cells and subsequent proliferative vitreoretinopathy formation. Laser photocoagulation can be used in attached areas of retina. Pseudophagic and high-risk eyes might benefit from 360-degree laser. Alternative option is to do a stage procedure. First, inject gas. Have a patient position with bubble on the tear to flatten the retina. And then perform laser to the retinal tear a few days after the retina is flat. Intraocular gas. You can use SF6 or C3F8. SF6 will span two times and lasts for one to two weeks. Volume of gas injected 0.5 to 0.6 cc. C3F8 will span four times and last for four to eight weeks. Volume of gas injected 0.3 cc. Use the smallest bubble needed to cover the pathology, keeping in mind that the gas volume needed to cover the given arc of retina will increase with myopy. Pre-fill the system to remove dead space before drawing up the amount of gas to be injected. And attaching a 30 gauge needle. Anterior chamber paracentesis. 27 or 30 gauge needle attached to a tuberculin syringe is used to enter in the anterior chamber at the limbus. 0.2 to 0.4 cc of fluid is usually withdrawn from the anterior chamber. Intraocular gas injection. Through an entry site in a quadrant away from the detachment. 
entered the eye vertically, 35 to 4 mm from the limbus, depending on the lens status, and inject the gas at moderate pace. Visualize the optic nerve head for the evaluation of intraocular pressure. Carefully evaluate the central retinal artery for perfusion and confirm light perception. Loss of pulsation requires decompression through an anterior chamber paracentesis. Instruct the patient on proper head positioning. Can draw an arrow in the clock hour of the retinal tear and instruct the patient to position their head so that the arrow is pointing straight up. Alternatively, can have patient's family take a picture while in the office with the proper head position, so the patient can reference this picture at home to properly position. Indications Retinal bricks located in the superior two-thirds of the fundus from 8 to 4 o'clock. No break in the inferior 4 o'clock hours. Single or multiple breaks within 1 o'clock hour. No proliferative vitreo retinopathy grade V or worse. Minimal media opacity. No glaucoma history. And patient able to maintain head positioning for 5 to 8 days after procedure. Remember, pneumatic retinopexy is currently underutilized. With appropriate patient selection, a high success rate can be achieved and anatomic success rates of over 19% can be achieved when the strict selection criteria are applied. There is a low rate of postoperative complications, and intraoperative complications are primarily related to the intraocular pressure rise caused by gas injection, or the misdirection of the gas. In selected cases, this procedure may present some advantages compared to the persplana vitrectomy and scleral buckling, playing an important role in the armamentarium of the vitreoretinal surgeon. Kyrielis plaques represent focal segmental retinal arteritis or periarteritis and are usually associated with infectious posterior uveitis or non-infectious autoimmune vasculitis. Kyrialis plaques were first described by Werner Kyrialis in 1933 as ring-like exudates extending along the width of the arteries and particularly where the vessels divided are whitish-yellow glycerin deposits seen along the outer walls of the retinal arterioles with high reflectivity. The veins were not affected. The chiralis plaques are also referred to in the literature by other names, as you can see here. Of all of them, the most suggested is segmental retinal arteritis. The etiology of Kyrielis plaques is unknown, but they always reflect severe intraocular inflammation. They have been typically associated with infectious posterior uveitis. And non-infectious posterior uveitis. The pathophysiology of these plaques is not completely known. Various hypotheses have been proposed. First, the plaques represented exudates migration from an adjacent retinochoroiditis focus to the periarterial seeds. The second hypothesis. 
deposits were constituted of cellular and inflammatory material within the arterial walls. The third, they were arteriosclerosis lesions. The fourth hypothesis suggests that the plaques do not represent periarterial or endoluminal injury, but the involvement of the arterial endothelium. The management of Kyrielis arteritis depends on the underlying etiology. The control of intraocular inflammation is the primary goal. The gnistering appearance of Kyrielis plaques may be clinically difficult to differentiate from other retinal vasculitic lesions where both arteries and veins are involved. But the exclusive arterial and endothelial involvement, along with absence of leakage or obstruction of lumen, or retinal arterial non-perfusion in fluorescein angiography, will help differentiate this from other conditions. Kyrielis arteritis is regarded as an extremely rare clinical entity. In fact, there are only approximately 20 cases reported in the literature, almost nine decades after its first description. However, some defend that this disorder is way more common than the literature has suggests as it may be considerably underreported. White-centered retinal hemorrhages, also known as rose spots, are retinal hemorrhages that can be seen in a variety of medical conditions. Rose spots are most commonly associated with infective endocarditis and have been detected in 80% of cases of subacute bacterial endocarditis. This is a characteristic rough spot. Originally described by Maurice Roth in 1872 while at the University of Basel, rough spots were first seen in individuals with bacteriemia secondary to subacute bacterial endocarditis. The retinal findings Roth made in 1872 were described as round, oval or flame-shaped hemorrhages with a central white spot, as you can see in this image. However, it was not until 1878 that this condition was assigned the name Roth spot by the biologist Litten. Litten reported that these white-centered retinal hemorrhages had been detected in 80% of cases associated with subacute bacterial endocarditis, thus cementing the hallmark association. Historically, Roth spots were considered to be a pathognomonic finding to bacterial endocarditis secondary to septic emboli within the retina. However, Roth spots occur in many pathological processes, as you can see listed here. Roth believed this spot represented disseminated embolic foci of bacterial abscesses originating from infective vegetation on heart bulbs. Given recent histological data, Roth spots are now believed to be a result of ruptured retinal capillaries and intraretinal hemorrhage. A common thread found in these pathologies is a predisposition to endothelial dysfunction that allows disruption of retinal capillaries. Histologic examination reveals that white center lesions are composed primarily of fibrin, which represents a plaque of fibrin and platelets at the site of vessel rupture. 
Other potential etiologies of rot spot are listed here. A thought of history should be taken with particular attention to medical history of previous infections and other history listed here. If roth spots are found on routine ophthalmologic examination, referral to a primary care physician for evaluation and workup of the systemic disease is suggested. The initial evaluation is based largely on results of a thorough history and physical examination. The complementary tests that will be most useful for the differential diagnosis are listed here. Roth spots are most often asymptomatic and do not require ophthalmological treatment. Visual disturbance due to roth spots is rare, but can occur with macular involvement. The most important management consideration in patients with roth spots is the identification of the causative etiology to prevent possible ocular and systemic complications that may occur due to the underlying disease. Roth spots, also classically associated with infective endocarditis, are a non-specific ophthalmologic finding with multiple etiologies. Retinal vessel rupture with whole blood extravasation and fibrin plaque development in the site of the vessel rupture is the mechanism by which Roth spots occur. A thorough history and physical examination are paramount in diagnosis the underlying disease and guiding treatment in patients with roth spots. If roth spots are found on routine ophthalmological examination, referral to a primary care physician for evaluation and workup of systemic disease is suggested. Identification of the underlying etiology is important in patients found to have roth spots, so that management can be guided to prevent any systemic or ocular complications that might occur. Roth spots are usually asymptomatic, do not require ophthalmologic treatment, and resolve with treatment of the underlying condition. In patients that present with concerns for endocarditis and roth spots, the clinician must carefully examine for other stigmata of endocarditis, including Janeway lesions, Osler nodes, and subangle splinter hemorrhages. Janeway lesions are irregular, flat, non-tender hemorrhagic macules located in the palms, soles, thenar and hypothenar eminences of the hands and plantar surfaces of the toes. Always remember, it is not painful in nature. They typically last for days to weeks. Janeway lesions consist of microabscesses in the dermis with thrombosis of small vessels without vasculitis. They are usually seen with the acute form of bacterial endocarditis. Osler nodes are painful, red, raised lesions found on the hands and feet. They are caused by immune complex deposition. It is important to remember that Osler's nodes are painful lesions. Janeway's lesions are not. Splinter hemorrhages are small spots of blood coming from the damaged blood vessel that appear under the nail and they are become visible through the nail. 
The bleeding creates a splinter-like line in the direction of the nail growth. Sussac syndrome is a rare condition that was first reported in 1973. The syndrome is characterized by a clinical triad of encephalopathy, sensory neural hearing loss, and visual disturbance resulting from branch retinal artery occlusion. It had been initially termed small infarctions of cochlear, retinal and encephalic tissues syndrome or retinopathy, encephalopathy and deafness microangiopathy syndrome. Susa Ketal described it in 1979 and Hoyt named it Susak syndrome in 1986. The encephalopathy is manifested by headache, motor deficiencies, sensor deficiencies, aphasia, cognitive impairment, and urinary insufficiency. The hearing loss is usually bilateral, and it can be associated with tinnitus and vertigo. The branch retinal artery occlusion may be extensive or subtle and unilateral or bilateral. The specific etiology of the syndrome is unknown. However, it is believed to be an autoimmune mediated condition that caused microinfarcts due to endothelium-induced occlusion of the microvessels in the central nerve system, inner ear and retina. The diagnosis is difficult to establish since the full clinical triad rarely exists on the first presentation. Workup for Susak syndrome includes magnetic resonance imaging, retinal fluorescein angiography, and audiogram. Although its prevalence is rare, Susak syndrome is an important differential diagnosis for several neurologic, psychiatric, ear, nose, throat, and ophthalmologic conditions. Treatment in the acute period may include high-dose glucocorticosteroids with a fast-onset immunosuppressive drug, intravenous immunoglobulin and plasmapheresis may also be a beneficial agent, hearing aids and cochlear implants can be offered to improve quality of life for those left with hearing loss. There has also been discussion about the use of antiplatelets, but these have not been shown to be beneficial. Prognosis for Susak syndrome is generally favorable with central nervous system and visual symptoms typically resolving with some compensation. However, hearing loss may be permanent and in rare cases the neurological effects of Susak syndrome can progress to dementia. Remember the characteristic clinical triad of Susak syndrome. And remember that this currently considered to be an autoimmune endotheliopathy that caused damage to the microvasculature of the brain, inner ear and retina. The first sign in ophthalmology is defined as a presence of proteins 
in suspension in the aqueous humor. These proteins in suspension transform the aqueous humor, in principle absolutely transparent, into a cloudy fluid. This increase in turbidity is in proportion to the number to the amount of proteins present in the suspension. These proteins generally appear as a consequence of the increased permeability of the vascular wall due to inflammatory processes, which makes the flare sign an important sign of intraocular inflammation. It is very common in uveitis and other intraocular inflammations or infections, such as endophthalmitis. In this video, we are going to see how the intensity of the flare sign is graded and, by extension, this classification is considered as one of the parameters of the degree of intraocular inflammation. How are we going to measure the flare sign? We will do it with the slit lamp and we will look for the best lighting with which we can see the iris as clearly as possible. We must observe the iris from the front, as we see a photograph on the right, following the optical axis. And we will measure the difficulty that we find in seeing the iris clearly. If we see the iris just blurry, we will classify it, we will reflect it in the medical history with a one cross, flare of a one cross. If we see the iris in a blurry way, two crosses. When we find it very difficult to see the iris, the iris looks very blurry, three crosses. And we will reflect in the clinical history a flare of four crosses when it is not possible to see the iris. And this would be the classification of the sign of flare. We have to say that being a qualitative classification, there may be variability on the part of the observer. However, it is a useful classification science. It will help us to establish the degree of intraocular inflammation and its evolution, its improvement or worsening throughout the entire inflammatory process. Thank you so much for your attention. In this video, we will talk about the headlight in the fog sign. This is a characteristic sign that occurs in toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. Headlight in the fog sign is defined as white focal retinitis with overlying vitreous inflammation. The image reminds us of the light of a lighthouse in the fog. The spot of light is a focal necrotizing retinitis, which stands out for its intense white color. In this clinical case, three troxoplasmic retinochoroiditis lesions appear, also the lower lesion is the one that shows the gritted brightness. All the vitreous presents a mild vitreous inflammation, but in this area we can see a greater inflammation, a moderate vitreous inflammation. And in this other area there is a severe vitreous inflammation. Retinal vasculitis, typically near of the focus of retinochoroiditis, is another of the classic findings of ocular toxoplasmosis. And here, on the nasal side, we see another focus of retinal periphlebitis. This is the headlight in the fog sign.
In this retinography, indicated with the arrows, we can see the sign of the double optic disc. The double optic disc sign is defined as the presence in the fundus of two images in which the optic disc can be appreciated. In this case, the double image is due to the specular reflection of the real optic disc. Situated this mirror image at the gas fluid interface. As we can see here, this patient has a C3 effect gas bubble. and transconjunctival cryopexy. Surgical procedures he had received due to two retinal tears and a retinal detachment located in the temporal superior area of the right eye. Hertog's sign or Queen Anne sign is a thinning or loss of the outer third of the eyebrows. It was described by the Belgian internist Eugene Ludovic Christian Hertog, a native of Ambert who worked in Brussels. Eugene Hertog is considered the first pioneer in thyroid function research. In this image, you can clearly appreciate this sign, the loss in this case, or thinning or impoverishment of the eyebrow in its outermost third. Hertog presented his observations on eyebrow alopecia in hypothyroid patients at the International Surgery Congress, Columbia, in 1914. In addition to this sign, Hertog drew many other clinical conclusions of hyperthyroidism. The result of careful and repeated observation of this pathology whose study he dedicated his whole life. Hertog's work achieved great recognition from his contemporaries, even holding the position of Vice President of the Royal Academy of Medicine of Belgium. This sign is also called the Queen Anne sign. This name is based on the association with the portrait of Queen Anne of Denmark, a fragment of which you can see here. In this portrait, which represents her in mourning for the death of her son Enrique in 1612, a loss of the external third of the eyebrow can be seen. Although, historically, there is no evidence that she suffered from hypothyroidism. As we have commented, Hertog described this sign associated with hypothyroidism, which is why it became a classic sign of this disease. But it is also a frequent sign that we can find associated with atopic dermatitis. Thallium poisoning, lepromatous leprosy, and prior to Ertoge, Jean Alfred Fournier had described eyebrow tail alopecia, observing it on some passengers while riding public transport in Paris. And this eyebrow waxing that he observed related to the frequent cases of secondary syphilis that were so common then. It is the, this medical doctor and the way in which he observed this sign, in this case associated with secondary syphilis, which also receives the curious name of the omnibus sign a name given to the horse-drawn carriages used as public transport at the time. 
The Coca-Cola bottle sign is a radiological sign that affects the extrinsic ocular musculature in patients with thyroid eye disease, patients with Graves' ophthalmopathy. It is defined as an enlargement of the muscle belly. With respect to the tendinous insertion, simulating the appearance of the traditional Coca-Cola bottle. For us, the nature of muscle enlargement is very important, since it is one of the main findings to differentiate it from idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome, orbital pseudotumor in which the tendinous insertion is also compromised and enlarged, unlike the thyroid eye disease. Here you can see other examples of this radiological sign. Remember that in orbital pseudotumor, the tendinous insertions are also affected. They are also enlarged, which helps to distinguish between the two diseases.